And welcome to Julius Caesar Act 5. The motions have been carried out, the stage is set, and now we begin the finale. As I've said many times throughout these videos, this is a tragedy, which means you should not be surprised when most, if not everybody, dies at the end. The question is not so much that they die or will they die, but it's how and why. What lessons can we get out of this? What themes can we learn about life in general? What motifs do we see? Things that occur over and over. Act 5 has five scenes. Uh, two of them are uh, a little bit lengthy. Uh, one is a uh, medium length, the last one, and two of them are extremely short, uh, really just filler scenes. Uh, for the most part, Act 5 is pretty easy to follow. However, there are a couple uh, confusing parts. You are going to see a number of characters you have not seen before. Oftentimes, these are servants of Brutus or Cassius or Mark Antony. Uh, please just uh, do your best you can with them. Uh, don't worry so much about their names, but see how much they uh, influence the plot in general. Uh, you want to look for here the relationship between Octavius and Mark Antony. You want to look for uh, Brutus and Cassius and how they deal with their impending doom. Are they tragic heroes or are they just tragic? And finally, uh, ask yourself, who was the noblest Roman of them all? So with that, let's get started with Julius Caesar, Act 5, Scene 1. Now, Antony, our hopes are answered. You said the enemy would not come down but keep the hills and upper regions. It proves not so. Their battles are at hand. They mean to warn us at Philippi here, answering before we do demand of them. Tut, I am in their bosoms, and I know wherefore they do it. They could be content to visit other places and come down with fearful bravery, thinking by this face to fasten in our thoughts that they have courage, but tis not so. Prepare you, generals. The enemy comes on in gallant show. Their bloody sign of battle is hung out and something to be done immediately. Octavius, lead your battle softly on, upon the left hand of the even field. Upon the right hand, I keep down the left. Why do you cross me in this exit? I do not cross you, but I will do so. Those of you that are familiar with history know that eventually Mark Antony is defeated by Octavius Caesar. Uh, this is sort of the beginning of that. Octavius ignores what Mark Antony says, uh, and, and it sets up the coming feud. Shakespeare's audience would have known this watching the play. They stand and would have parley. Stand fast, Titinius. We must out and talk. Mark Antony, shall we give sign of battle? No, Caesar, we will answer on their charge. Make forth. The generals would have some words. Stir not until the signal. Words before blows? Is it so, countrymen? Not that we love words better as you do. Good words are better than bad strokes, Octavius. In your bad strokes, Brutus, you give good words. Witness the hole you made in Caesar's heart, crying, long live, hail Caesar. There's a lot of footnotes there. Check them out before you move on. Antony, the posture of your blows are yet unknown, but for your words they rob the Hybler bees and leave them honeyless. Not stingless, too. Oh, yes, and soundless, too. For you have stolen their buzzing, Antony, and very wisely threat before you sting. Villains! You did not sow in your vile daggers, hacked one another in the sides of Caesar. You showed your teeth like apes, and fawned like hounds, and bowed like bondmen kissing Caesar's feet, whilst damned Casca, like a cur, behind struck Caesar on the neck. Oh, you flatterers. Flatterers? Now, Brutus, thank yourself. This tongue had not offended so today if Cassius might have ruled. Come, come, the cause. If arguing make us sweat, the proof of it will turn to redder drops. Look, I draw a sword against conspirators. When think you that the sword goes up again? Never, till Caesar's three and thirty wounds be well avenged, or till another Caesar have added slaughter to the sword of traitors. Caesar, thou canst not die by traitors' hands unless thou bringst them with thee. So I hope. I was not born to die on Brutus's oh, sword. Oh, if thou wert the noblest of thy strain, young man, thou couldst not die more honourable. 
<laughs> peevish schoolboy, worthless of such honour, joined with a masker and a reveller. Old Cassius still. Come, Antony, away. Defiance, traitors, hurl we in your teeth. If you dare fight today, come to the field. If not, when you have stomachs. So that's an interesting scene. I would go back and rewatch it. It moves rather quickly, but there's a lot of wordplay back and forth. Each side calling the other traitors, each side calling the other flatterers, each side uh, basically saying the other side is hypocritical. And when you think about it, they're both correct. Both uh, sides uh, manage to manipulate others in order to get what they want. And that's one of the larger messages of this play. Even though there are some noble aspects to Brutus and noble aspects to Mark Anthony, uh, both of them uh, really, in the end, are looking out for themselves, as are Octavius and Cassius. Why now blow and swell billow and swim bark? The storm is up, and all is on the hazard. Oh, Lucilius! Hark, a word with you. My lord? Masala. What says my general? Masala, this is my birthday, as this very day was Cassius born. Give me thy hand, Masala. Be thou my witness that, against my will, as Pompey was, am I compelled to set upon one battle all our liberties. You know that I held Epicurus strong in his opinion. Now I change my mind, and partly credit things that do presage. Coming from Sardis, on our former ensign two mighty eagles fell, and there they perched, gorging and feeding from our soldiers' hands who to Philippi here consorted us. This morning are they fled away and gone, and in their steads do ravens, crows, and kites fly o'er our heads and downward look on us as we were sickly prey. Their shadows seem a canopy most fatal under which our army lies, ready to give up the ghost. Believe not so. I but believe it partly, for I am fresh of spirit and resolve to meet all perils very constantly. Now, all of a sudden, Cassius is starting to believe in these omens. He sees that the eagles have left and the crows have come in. He is starting to realize that it's over for him. Even so, Lucilius. Now, most noble Brutus, the gods today stand friendly, that we may love us in peace, lead on our days to age. But since the affairs of men rest still uncertain, let's reason with the worst that may befall. If we do lose this battle, then is this the very last time we shall speak together? What are you then determined to do? Even by the rule of that philosophy by which I did blame Cato for the death which he did give himself. I know not how, but I do find it cowardly and vile for fear of what might fall, so to prevent the time of life. Arming myself with patience to stay the providence of some high powers that govern us below. Then, if we lose this battle, you are contented to be led in triumph thorough the streets of Rome. No, Cassius, no. Think not, thou noble Roman, that ever Brutus will go bound to Rome. He bears too great a mind. But this same day must end that work the Ides of March begun. And whether we shall meet again, I know not. Therefore, our everlasting farewell take, for ever and for ever. Farewell, Cassius. If we do meet again, why, we shall smile. If not, why, then this parting was well made. Forever and forever farewell, Brutus. If we do meet again, we'll smile indeed. If not, tis true, this parting was well made. Why, then, lead on. Oh, that a man might know the end of this day's business ere it come. But it sufficeth that the day will end, and then the end is known. Come home! Away! These are two different characters than we saw in Act One. Rather than trying to change fate and set things in motion, they both seem rather content with letting things happen the way they will. They don't know how the day will end, but they know that the day will end. And at the end of the day, they will know how the day ends. It sounds sort of silly, but when you think about it, there's a lot of truth to it. Both of these characters uh, have decided uh, they know how they're going to react. Uh, in the end, they are defeated. Now we move on to scene two, which is incredibly brief, uh, used to bridge the gap between one and three. Right! Right, Mr. 
Sala ride and give these bills unto the legions on the other side. Let them set on at once, for I perceive but cold demeanor in Octavia's wing, and sudden push gives them the overthrow. Ride, ride, Masala! Let them all come down! So, uh, in a very brief glimpse of the battle, Brutus thinks that Octavius is vulnerable and he's asking all the soldiers to rush in and attack. And we'll see if his uh, play pays off. Oh, look, Titinius, look, the villains fly. Myself up to mine own turned enemy. This ensign here of mine was turning back. I slew the coward and did take it from... Oh, Cassius, Brutus gave the word too early who, having some advantage on Octavius, took it too eagerly. His soldiers fell to spoil whilst we, by Antony, are all enclosed. Fly further off, my lord. Fly further off. Mark Antony is in your tents, my lord. Fly, therefore, noble Cassius. Fly far off. This hill is far enough. Look, look, Titinius. Are those my tents where I perceive the fire? They are, my lord. Titinius, if thou lovest me... Mount thou my horse, and hide thy spurs in him, till he have brought thee up to yonder troops and here again, that I may rest assured, whether yon troops are friend or enemy. I will be here again, in with a thought. Go, Pindarus, get higher on that hill. <laughs> my sight was ever thick. Regard to Tinius, and tell me what thou notest about the field. This day I breathed first. Time is come round, and where I did begin, there shall I end. My life is run his compass. Sira, what news? Oh, my lord! What news? Titinius is enclosed round about with horsemen that make to him on the spur. Yet he spurs on. Now they are almost on him. Now, Titinius. Now some light. Oh, he lights too. He's tame. And hark, they shout for joy. Come down, behold no more. Oh, coward that I am to live so long to see my best friend tame before my face. Come here, the Cyril. In Parthia did I take thee prisoner, and then I swore thee, saving of thy life, that whatsoever I did bid thee do, thou shouldst attempt it. Come now, keep thine oath. Now be a free man, and with this good sword that ran through Caesar's bowels, Search this bosom. Stand not to answer. Here, take thou the hilts, and when my face is covered, as tis now, guide thou the sword. <gasps> Caesar, thou art revenged. Even with the sword that killed thee. So, I am free. Yet would not so have been, durst I have done my will. Doc Cassius. Far from this country, Pindarus shall run, where never Roman shall take note of him. It is but changed, Titinius, for Octavius is overthrown by noble Brutus' power, as Cassius' legions are by Antony. Well, these tidings would well comfort Cassius. Oh, where did you leave him? All disconsolate with Pindarus' bondman on this hill. Is not that he that lies upon the ground? He lies not like the living. Oh, my heart. Is not that he? No. This was he, Messala. So it seems that Cassius was wrong. He sent uh, his friend Titinius to go investigate. It looked from a distance as though Titinius had been captured, but really, uh, Titinius was greeted by friendly soldiers. So as a result of this misunderstanding, Cassius has killed himself. It's sort of interesting. Cassius actually may have won the battle had he not killed himself. At this point, Brutus has taken over Octavius, while Anthony has taken over Cassius. It would have been even, but the suicide changes things. It makes you wonder if the characters, again, are in control of their own fate or not. But Cassius is no more. Oh, setting sun, as in thy red rays thou dost sink to night, so in his red blood Cassius' day is set. The sun of Rome is set. Our day is gone. 
Clouds, dews, and dangers come. Our deeds are done. Mistrust of my success hath done this deed. Mistrust of good success hath done this deed. Oh, hateful error. Melancholy's child, why dost thou show to the apt thoughts of men the things that are not? Oh, error soon conceived, thou never comest unto a happy birth, but killst the mother that engendered thee. What, Pindarus? Where art thou, Pindarus? Oh, seek him to Tinius, whilst I go to meet the noble Brutus, thrusting this report into his ears. I may say, thrusting it. For piercing steel and darts in venomed shall be as welcome to the ears of Brutus as tidings of this sight. Hi you, Miss Sala, and I will seek for Pindarus the while. Why didst thou send me forth, brave Cassius? Did I not meet thy friends? Did not they put on my brows this wreath of victory and bid me give it thee? Didst thou not hear their shouts? Alas, thou hast misconstrued everything! But hold thee. Take this garland on thy brow. Thy Brutus bid me give it thee, and I will do his bidding. Brutus, come apace, and see how I regarded Gaius Cassius. By your leave, gods. This is a Roman's part. Come, Cassius' sword and find Titinia's heart. Where? Where, Masala, doth his body lie? Lo, yonder, and Titinius mourning it. Titinius faces upward. He is slain. Oh, Julius Caesar, thou art mighty yet. Thy spirit walks abroad and turns our swords in our own proper entrails. Brave Titinius, look where he have not crowned dead Cassius. Are yet two Romans living such as these? The last of all the Romans, fare thee well. It is impossible that ever Rome should breed thy fellow. Friends, I owe more tears to this dead man than you shall see me pay. I shall find time, Cassius. I shall find time. Come, therefore, and to Thassos send his body. His funeral shall not be in our camp, lest it discomfort us. Lucilius, come, and come, young Cato. Let us to the field. Labio and Flavius set our battles on. Tis three o'clock, and Romans yet ere night. We shall try fortune in a second fight. And so now we move into the last two scenes. Brutus has seen Cassius kill himself. Brutus knows that the power of Caesar reigns. Uh, and, and they've started to change their minds at how they view Caesar. He's no longer uh, an evil uh, dictator. They're starting to view him as a, more of a force uh, that's, that's after them. They start to realize that maybe some of what they did was not noble and it's coming back to harm them. Uh, let's continue again. There are a lot of characters that we have not met before. Uh, they are all servants of Brutus and Cassius, and they uh, will serve in the background to carry out some major events. Yes, countrymen! Oh, yes! Hold up your heads! What bastard doth not? Who will go with me? I will proclaim my name about the field! I am the son of Marcus Cato, ho! A foe to tyrants and my country's friend! I am the son of Marcus Cato, ho! And I am Brutus! Marcus Brutus I! Brutus, my country's friend! Know me for Brutus! Ah! Oh, young and noble Cato, art thou down? Why, now thou diest as bravely as Titinius, and mayst be honoured being Cato's son. Yield, or thou diest. <laughs> Only I yield to die. There is so much that thou wilt kill me straight. 
kill Brutus and be honoured in his death. Well, we must not. A noble prisoner. Room ho, tell Antony Brutus is tamed. I'll tell the news. Here comes the general. Brutus is tamed. Brutus is tamed, my lord. Where is he? Safe, Antony. Brutus is safe enough. I dare assure thee that no enemy shall ever take alive the noble Brutus. The gods defend him from so great a shame. When you do find him, or alive or dead, he will be found like Brutus, <laughs> like himself. This is not Brutus, friend. But I assure you, a prize no less in worth. Keep this man safe, give him all kindness. I'd rather have such men my friends than enemies. Go on, and see where Brutus be, alive or dead, and bring us word unto Octavius' tent how everything is chanced. So now we begin Act 5, Scene 5, the last scene. In the previous scene, you had Lucilius pretending to be Brutus in order to save Brutus from being captured. Um, what is the purpose of this scene? Well, it gives us a little insight into Mark Antony's character. You'll notice he's a little more diplomatic. He uh, would rather take this man with him, keep him prisoner, uh, bring him onto his side, than just go out and kill him. Obviously, Lucilius is uh, very honorable if he's willing to do this for Brutus. Uh, also, on a practical note, it gives the actors from scene three time to change, to reposition themselves, and get ready for the final scene. So, here we go, Act 5, Scene 5, the end of the play. Come. Poor remains of friends rest on this rock. Statilius showed the torchlight, but my lord, he came not back. He is ortain or slain. Sit thee down, Clytus. Slaying is the word. It is a deed in fashion. Hark thee, Clytus. What? I, my lord? No, not for all the world. Peace, then. No words. I'd rather kill myself. Hark thee, Dardanius. Shall I do such a deed? O oh, Dardanius. O oh, Clytus. What ill request did Brutus make to thee? To kill him, Clytus. Look, he meditates. Now is that noble vessel full of grief that it runs over even at his eyes. Come hither, good Volumnius, list a word. What says, my lord? Why this, Volumnius? The ghost of Caesar hath appeared to me, two several times by night at Sardis once, and this last night here in Philippi Fields. I know my hour is come. Not so, my lord. Nay, I am sure it is, Volumnius. Thou seest the world, Volumnius? How it goes. Her enemies have beat us to the pit. It is more worthy to leap in ourselves than tarry till they push us. Good Volumnius, thou knowest that we two went to school together. Even for that, our love of old, I prithee. Hold thou my sword hilts whilst I run on it. That's not an office for a friend, my lord. Fly, fly, my lord, there is no tarrying here. Farewell to you, and you, and you, Volumnius. Strato, thou hast been all this while asleep. Farewell to thee too, Strato. Countryman, my heart doth joy that yet in all my life I found no man but he was true to me. I shall have glory by this losing day, more than Octavius and Mark Antony by this vile conquest shall attain unto. So fare you well at once, for Brutus' tongue hath almost ended his life's history. Night hangs upon mine eyes, my bones would rest, that have but laboured to attain this hour. Based on what you just heard, why does Brutus want to kill himself? Is he doing it for honor, or is he doing it for his own personal glory? He does mention that he will gain more than Mark Antony Octavius will. Does that change anything? Does it matter? I mean, if you're dead, you're dead, right? Another thing to think about. 
Fly, my lord, fly. Hence, I will follow. Ah, prithee, straight home. Stay thou by thy lord. Thou art a fellow of a good respect. Thy life hath had some smatch of honour in it. Hold then my sword and turn away thy face while I do run upon it. Wilt thou, straight home? Give me your hand first. Fare you well, my lord. Farewell, good straight home. Caesar, now be still. I killed not thee with half so good a will. What man is that? My master's man. Straighter, where is thy master? Free from the bondage you are in, Masala. The conquerors can but make a fire of him. For Brutus only overcame himself, and no man else hath honour by his death. So Brutus should be found. I thank thee, Brutus, that thou hast proved Lucilius' saying true. All that served, Brutus, I will entertain them. Fellow, wilt thou bestow thy time with me? Ay, if Masala will prefer me to you. Do so, good Masala. How died my master, Strato? I held the sword, and he did run on it. Octavius, then take him to follow thee. That did the latest service to my master. This was the noblest Roman of them all. All the conspirators, save only he, did that they did in envy of great Caesar. He only, in a general honest thought and common good to all, made one of them. His life was gentle, and the elements so mixed in him that nature might stand up and say to all the world, This was a man. According to his virtue, let us use him with all respect and rites of burial. Within my tent, his bones tonight shall lie, most like a soldier, ordered honourably. So call the field to rest and let's away, to part the glories of this happy day. So that's the end, the tragedy of Julius Caesar. There's a lot to think about here at the end. <clears throat> we see some insight into Brutus's character. Brutus doesn't have his servant stab him. Brutus himself runs on the sword. Brutus also says in his final lines, Caesar, be still, I killed thee with half so good a will. In other words, uh, Brutus thought more about killing Caesar than he did about killing himself. Even though Brutus does stab Caesar, he did not do it because he hated him. He did it because he loved Rome. Mark Antony echoes this when he says, Truly, this was the most noble Roman of them all. Mark Antony, uh, despite the fact that he is manipulative at times, is able to recognize this greatness. And even Octavius uh, shows some, some good leadership qualities. He brings in the enemy at the end. He forgives all of them uh, as an effort to bring unity. Uh, he honors Brutus, even though Brutus was his former enemy. Caesar, you remember, was arrogant and said that anyone that stood against him was foolish and he would be immortal, whereas Octavius and Anthony are both uh, a little more measured. Still, a lot of uh, powerful themes in this. We have elements of the supernatural throughout. We have the debate between fate and the debate between action. We have different uh, persuasive techniques using people's emotions or using logic. So as we go forward, as we finish the study guide, as we have our class discussions, and as ultimately you write your paper, uh, be sure to think about these things. If you ever missed anything in this act or any of the other acts, please go through and take a look at the footnotes. Also check your textbook. There's copies of uh, slightly different footnotes in there as well. Remember, you want to be looking for key quotes that uh, show some of the major themes of the story. And I've tried to illustrate those throughout these videos. Let me know if you have any questions. But for now, congratulations. You've made it through yet another Shakespearean play. Well done.